All right. Hello. Welcome, everybody. This is the California Coastal Resilience Network webinar series. Today, we have a great speaker lined up to discuss the managed retreat project at Surfers Point in Ventura, California. Before we get there, however, there are a few announcements. As you may have noticed, this is no longer Carrie Boyle's voice. My name is Dan Hosfeld. I'm the new Sea Grant Fellow for the Coastal Conservancy's Climate Ready Program. Carrie is moving on to undoubtedly great things after her fellowship. I've taken over her responsibilities as the coordinator for the California Coastal Resilience Network. I know there are some folks who heard about this webinar through the SCC mailing list. So for those of you unfamiliar with the Coastal Resilience Network, you're among a group of professionals exchanging knowledge on adaptation solutions that prepare California's coastal communities and habitats for impacts related to our changing climate. So today, we have Paul Jenkin from Surfrider to present on the Surfers Point project, as well as Kara Kemmler, the Coastal Conservancy's project manager for Surfers Point and a member of the Surfers Point Working Group. They'll both be available to answer questions when the presentation concludes. As a reminder for how the GoToWebinar interface is going to work, uh, if you have a question, you can navigate to the questions box and type in your question at any point throughout the talk or when we ask you for them. Um, I will read your questions aloud to Paul and Kara and follow up. Questions are welcome. We will follow up after the webinar with a recording and uh, the slides that you're about to see. Thanks for bearing with me on all of that. So I'm going to switch screens now and hand it off to Paul. All right. How's that looking? Looks good. Hello, we can Dan. see the slides if you want to make it full screen. There you go. Looks great. All right. Okay, good. Well, thanks for inviting me here today, Dan. Um, I see there's over 50 people on the line, so um, it's kind of strange talking to a, a blank screen knowing that there's 50 faces out there. So thanks for uh, calling in to listen to this today. This is an evolving presentation. I pulled together slides from, uh, I got some of Louis White slides from uh, ESA and, and some of the City of Ventura slides and other slides that have evolved. This has been a long, long project as you'll see. Um, I am the Ventura Campaign Coordinator for the Surfrider Foundation and have been involved in coastal issues in Ventura County since uh, 1994. Um, I'm sure most of you know, but Ventura is uh, just about an hour north of LA, depending on traffic. And uh, uh, Ventura is a, a nice little coastal town with uh, a really popular surf spot called Surface Point or Seaside Park, Sea Street, uh, or just the point. Um, is located on Ventura County Fairgrounds property and City of Ventura uh, property down by the pier. Um, I always like to show this overview because uh, it demonstrates how these California surfing points work. Uh, you know, you've heard of a lot of famous places in California known uh, worldwide for great surf, Rincon Point, Malibu Point, Trestles, uh, all of these are river mouths, river mouths that deliver tons of sediment over thousands of years and develop these big uh, deltas, which uh, present an opportunity for, in this case, these westerly swells come in out of the Santa Barbara Channel and wrap around the point and provide uh, a long uh, rolling wave that uh, is a lot of fun. Uh, you can also see here the fairgrounds and the Ventura River mouth background. So back in 1989, this uh, bike path was constructed on the beach. You can see here uh, on the left is sort of the during construction. You can see that there were some dunes out there that were kind of leveled 
um, and uh, there's a little bit left after the bike path was constructed. A lot of artificial fill was brought in to actually fill that beach all the way out. You can see the contrast between the beach sand and the fill, uh, and then the bike path, and, and then a parking lot built behind it. Uh, it was just uh, a couple of years before I started seeing damage. You could see all the people on the uh, bike path during big high tide swell situations, everybody comes out to watch the bike path start to fall into the ocean <laughs> and it pretty quickly uh, started looking like this. This is up by the river mouth. This is um, uh, this is actually an area where rocks were dropped to try and prevent this erosion. And you can see here, uh, does my uh, pointer show there? No. Um, you can see where rocks were dropped and erosion exacerbated. It's, you know, sometimes we call that the end effect of, of a coastal structure that uh, at the edge of it, you start to get worse erosion. And that's what started really carving out the, the parking lot there. So in 1995, it was, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of proposals for armoring this section of coast. And uh, it was all about preserving the bike path uh, and not about the beach. Um, so these were sort of the options that, that we were um, provided at the time. Uh, a standard revetment, pile of rocks, step seawall. Uh, this was advertised by the coastal engineers as uh, you know, providing a place where people could sit and watch the surfers because you'd have all those steps and you could walk down into the, into the water. Um, and then uh, because of our advocacy, this idea of a cobble berm was introduced as a, as a softer uh, coastal hardening solution. But, um, you know, here's the contrast uh, just up the coast. There's another point called uh, Pitus Point where uh, medium to high tides, there is no beach and you can't walk up the beach at all. And uh, this was uh, potentially the fate at Surfers Point. So uh, I've got some slides here that sort of outline the timeline. In 1989, the... Um, uh, the shoreline improvements were constructed under Coastal Commission permit. Now that permit designated these as temporary. This was actually largely due to uh, surf riders advocacy back in, in the 80s, um, where we were uh, quite convinced at the time that building anything that close to the edge would uh, be damaged. And so the Coastal Commission did uh, condition that permit that it would not be uh, permanent and not be uh, permittable to armor it in the future. Um, by 1991, uh, that emergency revetment went in uh, to try and slow the erosion, um, and people were wondering what was going to happen. Um, in 1995, <clears throat> the uh, former state congressman pulled together a working group of local um, agencies, uh, stakeholders, and state agencies uh, to try and figure out what a solution could be. Um, and at that point, this idea of managed retreat was was kind of forwarded and, and became accepted as conceptual plan in 96. Um, and then we were looking at some grants in 98. Uh, this is the working group, the fairgrounds, the city, uh, the state parks, Coastal Commission, Coastal Conservancy, state legislators, and then locally had the Surfrider Foundation, uh, Full Sail Windsurfing Club, and uh, Ventura County Bicycle Coalition, all representative. And uh, we had, uh, you know, more than a decade of, of meetings uh, with this working group, trying to figure out what um, the solution would be with the goals to uh, protect Shoreline Drive um, and the bike path from future erosion and replace the lost parking, stabilize the uh, shoreline. Um, and then, you know, this idea of relocating the bike path out of harm's way and restoring to a more natural setting is what kind of, you know, was based upon this concept of, of managed shoreline retreat. And so uh, these are sort of some artist renditions that, um, the city of Ventura put together at the time to kind of envision what managed retreat might look like. 
Um, and you can see down in the bottom left that that area right there is the retreat zone that you'll see aerial photos of coming up. And the, this, this rendition is not too far off. The main point here is that we're actually retreating. We're actually moving uh, infrastructure inland and providing uh, a, a buffer zone for the beach to come and go as it would naturally. And here, um, you know, this is sort of a politically determined line. This is 64 feet and six inches. So that was, uh, that's what we were given to work with. Um, <clears throat> that looks like the same timeline that I just showed a minute ago. Um, so uh, 1999, got some preliminary engineering done. Um, there was a, a kind of a pilot project to see what would happen if you nourish the shoreline with, with cobble in 2000. Um, and then there was a variety of approvals uh, with the working group and the fair board uh, to get this project uh, moving forward. Uh, EIR was completed in 2003, MOU between the, the fair board and the city in 2008. Um, and uh, at the same time, the final design and permits were underway. So this is what the cobble nourishment looked like uh, in September of 2000. Um, after the fact, we actually objected to the fact that if you look at some of this cobble, it's uh, actually boulder size. Cobbles are technically six to 18 inches in diameter. And these boulders currently sit on the beach um, and are a hazard to those of us coming in on a surfboard at the right tide. But uh, boulders stick around and slide down the beach face and end up in the surf zone. Um, the cobble ultimately moved down the coast, but um, there was uh, other subsequent cobble nourishment projects since then also. And we found that the cobble does move fairly rapidly along the shoreline. Um, and so this preferred alternative uh, came out of the, the public meeting at which we actually were able to get about 100 people uh, to show up and advocate for this alternative, which was the, the Surfrider alternative at the time, um, which rather than putting that cobble on the beach uh, as a, a sort of a beach nourishment, dump it on the beach to protect the beach um, uh, solution, instead it moved that cobble berm back in the back shore um, and then uh, buried it under dunes. So this was the concept that uh, was approved and then we moved forward on, on the design with. So the key here was retreat, moving the infrastructure back. And then rather than nourishing the active, um, you know, literal beachfront, uh, rather nourish the back shore, replace the artificial fill with beach compatible materials and, uh, and construct the dunes on top of that. So this was a concept plan for the entire project. Um, you can see here there's some tallying of parking spaces, and that was uh, you know, a big part of the discussion, still a big part of the discussion. Always the focus of the discussion from the fairgrounds perspective was how many parking spaces uh, we had out there. So the intent here was to replace the parking that you can see kind of in the yellow zone along the beachfront there with the parking in the brown and green zones in the back. Um, but that whole yellow zone along the front there, this picture was actually taken during the fair. So those are all RVs and trucks and, and uh, people that were there for the fair activities. But you can see uh, how much uh, parking is used during the fair. And um, with all of that gone, it was just uh, always an issue for the fairgrounds as to uh, how they were going to replace that and how they were going to operate during fair time. Uh, now, of course, when the surf is up, those same parking spots are filled with surfers and overflowing <laughs> with surfers. So it's not only an issue for the fairgrounds, but also for uh, the beach going public. So this is that uh, kind of perspective of uh, this full retreat project at the time 
and that's uh, another artist rendition looking at the the point area um, so this preliminary design uh, PWA and ESA were the coastal engineering consultants that um, did all the oceanfront work uh, with RRM design group doing uh, the landward improvements, which included the, you know, the new bike path, the road, and the parking lots. Um, there's also some drainage and other stuff I'll talk about in a minute here. But uh, you can see at the bottom there the image of that buried cobble berm. This is in the widest part of the beach at the point. There's areas where it's much narrower. Um, uh, PWA, ESA went and looked at the historic uh, shoreline alignments and you can see that green one out there was 1969. Uh, most of you probably know that was sort of the, the storm of the last century which deposited large quantities of sand and cobble uh, from the river mouth and, and really built the beach out uh, all the way back to a minimum in 1994 which is when we were seeing the 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 worst erosion of that newly constructed bike path so the shoreline comes and goes really based upon um, the climate the weather how much rain we have and the sediment supply to the coast and then determining that setback distance uh, was done using uh, sort of standard coastal analysis, looking at um, storm surge and wave setup and wave run up um, based, on, uh, based upon that higher tide level. So any of you who have been at the beach during high surf knows that uh, every once in a while that big wave comes rushing up the beach and goes and gets places that were uh, dry beforehand, gets them wet, and you often see people standing close to take a picture getting wet. That's that run up, uh, the highest run up zone, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Um, so from that, these setback lines were determined and um, uh, enabled the permitting of this really a new concept in California for, for a managed retreat as opposed to a hard structure. Another part of this project that was actually really important to us was um, the water quality uh, component of it. Um, the fairgrounds is actually historic wetland, so uh, it tends to fill up with water, and then all that water was pumped onto the beach and into the river untreated. So improving the drainage uh, and improving the the water treatment before it's pumped back onto the beach and into the river was a big part of this project. Um, when sort of 2008 came around, we were looking to fund the project and had about half of the money that we were looking for uh, earmarked or uh, available. Um, and Pretty much half the money came from a federal uh, transportation grant and the Coastal Conservancy uh, was the other half. The uh, city of Ventura had um, been putting in a lot of in-kind and uh, project management services along the way, but we didn't have the money to complete the entire project, which at the time was somewhere upwards of six or seven million dollars. So uh, we came up with a phasing plan which uh, provided the opportunity to move forward with a good demonstration of this concept. Um, and you can see here in this image, uh, parking to remove uh, the bottom left there is that area um, behind that remnant dune and up where the bike path was critically eroded. Um, and then leaving the remainder of the parking lot in place during phase one and constructing the new parking area back behind that retreat zone. <clears throat> uh, this was a big day for me because <laughs> this is after 15 years or something of, of haggling on this project, we came out and actually saw uh, they're starting to remove those K rails, which had been put in place to prevent people from falling off the edge of the bike path. Um, and uh, Construction was uh, 2010 to 2011, and then we came back later and, and built some dunes. So phase one 
was removing about half of the damaged parking lot, um, widening uh, that section of beach about 900 feet, uh, moving everything inland by over 60 feet. Um, the cobble that came in, 26,000 tons of cobble was imported from another project uh, actually on the Santa Clara River watershed nearby out in Santa Paula. Um, and that was brought in to create that buried cobble berm. Um, and uh, then 18,000 tons of sand was brought in. Uh, Shoreline Drive was actually uh, abandoned and, and um, uh, it's interesting, it's a city easement for Shoreline Drive onto the fairgrounds property. So uh, the city um, gave up that end section of Shoreline Drive for the retreat zone. Um, so everything was moved, uh, moved back, 1200 feet of, of bike path was reconstructed. Um, the rainwater parking and stormwater system was all put in place to help with the water quality, as I mentioned before. So this is what it looked like um, before on the left and then after. Uh, like I said, all that fill was excavated and then cobble was brought in to fill that zone. So this is sort of an eight foot thick by 60 foot wide um, fill of, of cobble and most of this cobble was in the 6 to 18 inch uh, range. You can see there's some bigger material there too but uh, this is all in now the backshore zone where uh, sand was brought in and um, Bob Battaglio had this uh, had this great idea to use water to jet the sand that was brought in into the uh, the gaps between the cobble and inter interstices there, which um, rather than have that sand slowly filter down and start creating sinkholes in the future, it was kind of done um, as part of the construction project and, and it's been uh, quite successful for the most part. And there's the finished product down there on the bottom right where uh, the, the cobble now is completely buried um, and sand is on top of it. Um, I will say that most of this sand came from an inland source and uh, cemented pretty heavily and we're still seeing that effect in, in some of the areas where it erodes uh, currently. But um, the dunes which we brought in subsequently in 2012 was actual uh, dune sand. This was sand that was imported from down in the bay, down in Pierpont, that was windblown sand from, from dunes and beach that were blowing back onto uh, properties along the beachfront. So that was brought up and filled, uh, and we actually came in, initially put in those uh, sand fences to prevent the sand from blowing back onto the bike path. And later, uh, create some hummocks and seeded and planted those dunes with uh, volunteers. I think that the, I don't remember the line item on this in the original project, but uh, you know, it's over $100,000 I think budgeted for dune vegetation, which I think we did for about 5,000 bucks. We got, um, Surfrider bought the seeds um, we actually got a small grant from Patagonia to bring in uh, some cabling to help guide foot traffic through the dune areas. And um, you can see here we we have had and continue to have volunteer work days out there. We get a lot of people come out and some, for some reason <laughs> are quite happy to come out and pull weeds for us. Unfortunately, the sand that was imported did have some weed seeds in it. Um, primarily Sea Rocket is the one that we've been battling, but um, many thanks to uh, Dave Hubbard, uh, photo there on the bottom left, um, who has helped guide us on that portion of the project. So this is sort of the before and after from the air. You can see where uh, all of those cars during the park, during the fair, are kind of right up uh, against the beach there, and then the retreat zone is built. Um, this was before the vegetation really set in, but you can see the hummocks 
of the dunes in the retreat zone. And also you look at these, these are sort of summer photos. So the beach is, is actually very sandy at this point. Um, on the ground, this is what it looked like. Uh, the erosion zone where the bike path was uh, gone. And um, after the fact, this is probably sort of a springtime, uh, early summer uh, image. You can see seaweed on the beach, but also you can see the edge of the cobble berm that is still exposed from the winter. Um, and we see this come and go. The sand comes and goes every year and uh, it's holding up quite well. In fact, the big event that we had was was the big storm, December 11th, 2015. Um, and I went out there and took these pictures and you could see that the very fore dune area was eroded, um, exposing some of the cobble. Um, and uh, there was some overtopping over the dunes. You can see it going, you know, wetting the sand back there. But uh, in general, very, very resilient. Um, and in comparison, just down the bay in Pierpont, um, there was no visible beach. and the, the waves were just rushing right over the beach and into the lanes down there. Um, we had quite a, uh, we had the El Nino uh, that year as well as uh, a big storm surge with this event. This was a 6.2 foot high tide that uh, measured 8.2 feet in the harbor. So we had sort of two feet of um, sea level rise, if you want to call it, um, with this event, which is certainly uh, sort of like the king tides, kind of a, a, a picture of the future that we might be expecting with sea level rise. Um, of course, the area is very popular, very heavily used. Um, everybody's out there on the bike path every day. Uh, surfers and here you can see a surf contest set up in the area that was designated for surf contests um, we put these signs up to let people know about the dune restoration process you can see that sign starting to rust and that was i think last last summer when i took that photo uh, but in general the vegetation is uh, predominantly native uh, species that have been seeded and uh, has stabilized the dunes quite nicely. Um, from the air, from the river mouth angle, you, looking down the coast, you can see uh, the phase one zone, um, the river mouth in the foreground, and then uh, the phase two planning area, you can really see how vulnerable that uh, parking lot is in in that reach uh, down towards the city beaches and uh, this picture was taken during the high tides uh, back in january when this bike path really started getting uh, critically damaged uh, this just happened since actually the last day of the fair that curb fell in during the high tide and then the winter swells really started to take take chunks out of the bike path um so as i said this has always been about parking and so uh this is kind of a, another view of that overview with the phase one retreat on the left and then the phase two area on the right and um i actually had a volunteer do this on gis uh, this is dated october 2017 um, to demonstrate how we could actually gain parking by uh, moving the parking back to Shoreline Drive and um, allowing that uh, remainder of that area to be used for uh, beach restoration in the retreat zone. Um, so uh, just this year, uh, we had um, Beacon had uh, applied for a grant um, and uh, the city of Ventura had uh, allocated some of their money to hire uh, RRM back to take an, another look at this project for the phase two uh, planning. And here you can see the blue zone is that phase two. And uh, this kind of a 
uh, rendition of what the parking might look like We're back along Shoreline Drive. There's another picture here. There we go. There's a good view of it. Um, so currently that area on the left along the beach is, is all parking and that's where the bike path is being eroded. So this would complete the entire project um, by being able to construct uh, the second phase. Uh, I should also note that in February of this year, the fairgrounds did unanimously vote in favor of uh, moving forward with this. So we have the green light. Um, we have a, a grant for the final design and engineering through the Ocean Protection Council. And um, we anticipate, well, I'd like to see construction in two years. <laughs> we'll see how, how quickly that happens. So going back out to the river mouth area again, you can really see how that uh, retreat zone provides that fairly wide buffer area for the beach to come and go. Uh, in this image, there's a lot of sand in the system, um, but you can see a little bit of that cobble berm exposed. Um, and then that's actually the Ventura R River levee that you can see just next to the, the water there and the Ventura uh, River um, Lagoon. Uh, and so uh, what we're seeing here really is the influx of sand and uh, uh, cobble from the river, which uh, in the last couple of years, this picture was actually just taken uh, last week, I think it was, or the week before, I think it was last week. Um, and it really gives you an overview of uh, the dynamic nature of this river mouth and the tremendous amount of uh, sediment that's delivered. Of course, we just had the Thomas fire, so if you had a lot of erosion in the watershed, a lot of sediment coming down the river. Um, and uh, with the relatively high surf that we've been having, the sand is not as visible, um, but there's a lot of sand offshore um, that I anticipate having extremely wide sandy beaches this summer. Uh, I would be remiss in mentioning, not mentioning, that uh, there's a dam 16 miles up the coast, which I got involved in planning for the removal of Matillaha Dam at about the same time as we started planning for this uh, shoreline retreat project. So I think it's uh, important to, to remember the watershed context. Um, Many of you have probably seen or written <laughs> some of these reports, um, and uh, Surfers Point has been uh, referenced in a lot of these studies of coastal resilience, uh, managed retreat, uh, natural infrastructure, um, whatever you, you want to call it right now in terms of coastal adaptation in response to climate change and shoreline erosion. So, um, obviously, managed retreat helped widen the beach, which made it much more enjoyable for beach users. And um, uh, going through a 15 to 20 year planning uh, process with multiple agencies uh, is never easy. Um, and some of the recommendations that come out of this is just engaging the agencies and the local public interest groups, uh, addressing uh, various issues, especially contamination early in the process, choosing the right uh, materials for the appropriate environment. In this case, we are on a cobble river mouth delta um, with ephemeral sand. So cobble uh, is certainly the material of choice. Um, and always providing, uh, trying to provide enough information so that people understand what, what's going on out there. Respect the beach. Uh, respect the beach. You can't, you can't hold back Mother Nature. You can certainly build sea walls, but over time, uh, you do lose the beach. So that's the aim with managed retreat. Um, and just finally, to put this in the watershed context, uh, Matillaha Dam is up there in the Los Padres National Forest, up in the mountains, blocking sand and cobble that feeds uh, the Ventura River Delta down in the bottom left. 
Uh, I put VenturaRiver.org down at the bottom right. I have been trying to document this project as much as possible. So there's a lot of additional information, uh, photos, and references on that website. So I think that's it. I haven't been looking at the time, but I assume we have time for questions. Hello, Dan. Okay, I'm hearing nothing and seeing nothing. I hope that that showed and that. <laughs> hey, Paul, it's Kara. I'm gonna jump yeah. in. I, I don't know what happened to Dan, but I'm seeing a, a question in the questions box. Can you see that or do you want me to read it? Okay, no, I was afraid that I just did a whole talk and nobody heard a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but silence. So here we go. Uh, yeah, what question do you have there? Let's see. Oh, there's a couple coming in now. Okay, so um, the first question is, where was the 18,000 tons of sand brought in from for phase one? Yeah, the sand came from the Pierpont neighborhood, um, which is just down, down the coast. And that was a result of uh, property owners uh, objecting to sand blowing back onto their property. So the city had to remove that and it was actually perfect timing because as i said that was uh that was real dune sand it was the right uh consistency and had no fine sediment uh in it so it made some great dunes um and this another question awesome presentation paul i'm curious if you had any advice or recommendations on patience and progress given the years and years that has taken for this project what can we as the Coastal Resilience Network do to encourage projects like this moving forward? Um, yeah, gee, I wish that there was an easy answer to that. It's, um, I think manage retreat is a very uh, difficult uh, political process to go through. And um, I believe that especially in the state of California, state agencies should be aligned with that goal uh, in terms of ensuring that we still have recreational beaches into the future. Um, so, I mean, the concern from us at Surfrider is that given three feet of sea level rise, we might not have any recreational beaches left because they're all gonna be armored. So in cases like this, where these are public parks and public recreational amenities, uh, it's really important to uh, try and align state agencies so that we have um, we do have beaches in the future. Okay. Um, and uh, the next question is related. What might have made this project happen faster? So if you want me to help you <laughs> with that one, <laughs> but I'll let you start. Well, again, it's all politics. We've had four different fair boards uh, through the life of this project so far. We're not done. Uh, and every time we had to go back to square one and re-begin the, the education and negotiation process. So uh, that certainly hasn't made it happen quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, there's there's a, a, a difficulty in local capacity and local expertise uh, within local jurisdictions. So um, it's never it's never easy. What, what were you going to say, Carol? I would just add that, um, as you highlighted in your presentation, that when we had a full plan, there wasn't enough funding. So we did phase it out. Um, and so we've had to kind of keep this momentum going and as you said re-education with the fair board and new staff at the city to move forward with phase two and still need to find funding for that so i think that <clears throat> beyond all of the planning and the politics that's um, played a role in this project we've also um, 
probably would have been able to build the project a lot sooner and full if we had had um, a big chunk of funding at that time. Money, money, money. Money helps, money helps for sure. Um, okay, so the next question, um, there appears to be a persistent erosion pocket immediately downstream east slash south of the river mouth where the levee along the south side of the river extends into the water. It appears to almost be acting as a groin. What about taking out those rocks, retreating the levee, and potentially having the sand be able to fill in? Oops, oh no, I just lost my question. Shoot, hold on. <clears throat> fill in that part of the beach, the north end of the managed retreat project. Yeah, very good question, Sean Kelly. <laughs> um, you know, initially that was that was part of the project. Um, uh, the levy is uh, certified by the Corps of Engineers, and at some point in the late '90s, I think they added that uh, they call it spur groin on the end there, which kind of kicks off at an angle. Uh, it's not that visible in this image, but you can kind of see the rocks on the beach there. Uh, and it is still exacerbating erosion, uh, downstream erosion. So um, that was part of the in initial um, project that we were advocating for. But again, multi-jurisdictional. I don't think that we would have ever got the project done if we were waiting for a core permit to remove rocks off the beach, but it, I think it should be considered in phase two. Okay, uh, next question. Recently after winter storm events coinciding with the Ventura River flowing, I saw the city removing sticks and other components of beach rock from the beach in front of and adjacent to the restoration site. Is there any potential to shift the paradigm from wanting to clean beaches and recognize that walking across seaweed and sticks to reach the water is part of the coastal experience to educate the city and the community that beach rack is not only critical habitat, but a key component of shoreline protection and to ultimately have the city modify their practices? Great question, great question. In fact, there's a funny story with that. The city had called me and said they were gonna do this. And I said, well, we had uh, agreed in the past that uh, the retreat zone was gonna be left natural. So take it off your city beaches, but leave it up there. Um, they came out, did the city beaches. And two weeks later, one of my uh, friends who is a Dawn Patrol surfer out there texted me and said, oh, they're out here with excavators. They're gonna, they're gonna go across the dunes uh, i called people at the city and asked them what was going on and uh convinced them to leave the driftwood uh they wanted to get the arundo off the beach turns out the primary concern was uh that the uh, uh the big homeless population locally would be using uh the driftwood to build uh homes out there um and I said, we'll leave the big driftwood, take the Arundo, um, and you know, let's figure out some policy in the future on how we're gonna handle this. The next week I walked out there, actually a couple days later, I walked out there and some guy had already built his home right in front of the boardwalk and had a tent pitched in there, his bicycle and his stove, and he was setting up camp. And uh, so, I emailed the city uh, folks and said, I don't think that this is a driftwood problem. I think that this is an enforcement problem. And uh, they called the cops and went and had that guy dismantle his home. But uh, just so you understand, it, this was uh, uh, certainly something that was uh, first and foremost on my mind. And uh, there needs to be some formal policy uh, figured out and how we're going to enforce homeless and everything else. Big, big issues. Um, okay. Is cobble being resupplied regularly or was cobble resupplied after the initial placement? If not, do you expect to? No, all that cobble is still buried. It's on the back shore back there. And although it has been designated as a cobble nourishment zone, 
uh, I don't anticipate that we're going to um, need to do that. In fact, in this aerial image, you can see how much cobble has come out of the river mouth this year. So I anticipate natural um, uh, renourishment of the area as long as the river mouth is flowing and uh, as long as sea levels don't get too high. Okay. Um, I haven't been reading the compliments, but I assume you can see them, Paul. Um, the next question, what is the flat area in the dunes? Uh, that's a good question. Um, during construction, uh, there was uh, a big push from the kite border contingents to make a nice safe kite launching area. And that is um, primarily what that area is. You can see there's no vegetation on it. It's flat and it does create a windblown sand uh, problem. So that is also another uh, tricky issue that needs to be addressed. Um, nice work. Did the plans include sea level rise projections? Yeah, and uh, I forgot what the numbers were now, but uh, somebody, sorry. Um, this was uh, whatever the sea level rise uh, guidance was in uh, 2010. So uh, it was accounted for, but that, you know, that guidance keeps going up. So <laughs> it remains to be seen. <clears throat> um, okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Um, I think this is a clarification. So the question earlier about the 18,000 tons of sand and where it came from for phase one, I think um, the question was about the sand that was placed over the cobble and the way that you answered it, I think was about the sand for the dune restoration, which may have been two different sources. So Louis is saying the sand 18,000 tons for phase one came from Santa Paula River. Uh, actually, Cayugas Creek, I think. The, the cobble came from Santa Paula, and I think the sand came okay. from Cayugas Creek. And, and again, uh, yeah, that was the initial sand that came in that was worked into the cobble. Um, and um, although theoretically it met spec, I think that specs on beach nourishment uh, materials need to be looked at real closely because a uh, very low percentage of fine material will cement that sand. And that's what we did see in this situation was cemented sand that creates an escarpment when it starts eroding. Okay. Um, were sea level rise projections included? Oh, somebody asked that already. Included in the design? If so, when were they from? You answered those. Is resilience for new projected sea level rise expected? Um, to, until what year? So you kind of answered that already, but if you want to elaborate. Yeah, you know, it's really hard to predict, and I suppose you could do analysis on this, but. Um, you know how this how this beach evolves with increasing sea level rise would be really interesting because, uh, like I said, it's so dynamic with the amount of material that comes out of the river mouth, um, and um, how the river mouth evolves over time is is certainly going to be interesting. And, it, and it's really good, in fact, that we have this uh, example sitting here um, that that we can watch and monitor. Um, now, if we go 10 feet, uh, I think it's going to be time to move the fairgrounds, honestly. But um, two or three feet, I think we can handle it, maybe. <laughs> Is that a scientific, non-scientific answer for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think also as we do final design for phase two, it's something we're going to be checking back on since the sea level rise projections were different back when we first started the planning. Um, okay, um, the next question, considering how much work this took, how could it be scaled to the remainder of the coast? Do you think this could have been done if residences or private property had been involved? 
no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've you've all seen the reaction of, of uh, residences. In fact, I was just at the the county sea level rise planning workshop, and the residents residents are all out in, in force, uh, especially if you start talking about managed retreat. Um, so. These are the questions, uh, as I mentioned before, in terms of recreational beaches. Are there areas that we can retreat, that we can maintain uh, recreational beaches under various sea level rise scenarios? And are there areas in which we are going to have to um, protect until we can no longer protect or afford to protect where there are coastal residences? Um, and are there other strategies where we can widen the beaches by um, uh, altering the, the way that we manage things like harbors and stuff? Uh, there might be some opportunities uh, to protect those residences in other ways than coastal armoring. Okay. Um, the next question you answered already, has the cobble been moving down shore at all? And it's all still buried, you said. Um, what sort of quantitative monitoring has been done for this effort, both physical and biological? Um, there have been beach profiles uh, conducted uh, annual or I think an annual basis, um, as well as vegetation monitoring. So uh, we're keeping a pretty close eye on things. Um, I think that there's been a little bit of uh, social monitoring too from Cal State Channel Islands. So there's there's been sort of some surveys of beach user groups and that type of thing. Um, you stated that the retreat distance was politically motivated. Was there any scientific basis for the retreat distance? Well, I gotta be careful what I say here because it was it was politically motivated, but the run-up analyses that were done uh, did justify that and uh, that uh, uh, that setback. In fact, if you look in this aerial picture, you can see that the way that the bike path kind of curves um, from the river mouth, it, it curves in inland a little bit before it goes back out again, and that was a, a change that was made in response to those run-up studies by by ESA, so, um, so yeah, it is scientifically justified. Um, I think the next question we answered, what does sea level rise modeling show regarding the effectiveness of phase one and upcoming phase two? In other words, what sea level rise is the projected to be effective over the long term? Yeah, so um, I think we answered that question. So Ashley, I'm gonna ask you to resubmit if you feel like we haven't answered or you, if you want clarification on. Um, what regulatory permits were obtained? You want, do you want to well, answer that, Paul, or you want me to? Yeah, I mean, you could probably help, but it's a coastal development permit primarily by the, the um, Coastal Commission. I don't remember their state lands and, and Army Corps jurisdiction. I don't remember. I don't think there was Army Corps, was there? I don't think there was Army Corps. I think just state lands determination, coastal permit, and then whatever building permits the city issued itself. I don't. I don't think we got a water board permit, did we? I can follow. I can. I can circle back, Caesar, if you. Um, if I. If I'm missing something. Yeah, that's a good question. It might have been a water quality permit with the whole uh, new water facilities. It's really testing our mem our memory. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, have you noticed any effects on the waves? Well, I will say that the surf here actually breaks at high tide. And um, I think that's because there is no armoring at this point, whereas further down in the bay, uh, you will uh, have uh, reflected waves and waves that aren't breaking and that type of thing. So I, I think maintaining uh, the setback and uh, doing the retreat has at least prevented the loss of surf in this area. 
and um, perhaps in the long term enhancement, just letting the natural processes take place. Okay, Caesar had a follow up about the permits. Were there what were the challenges in obtaining these? So um, the Coastal Commission was participating in the working group. So um, since that was the main permit, um, I think that that was addressed pretty well through having them participate in the process from early on. Um, do you remember any specific challenges, Paul, for permitting? Uh, no, there, there really wasn't because this was not a, a shoreline armoring project. The Coastal Commission was quite happy to permit something like this. Yeah, I would just say the only kind of challenges would be um, because of the public access and the resources, staging, um, you know, comes into play as you um, implement the project. And so those were, you know, conditions on the project, but um, not really challenges to getting the permits. Yeah, and I guess if Rick uh, Raves was on the line, he could... Uh, you know, he was directly involved in that, so we we weren't. I wasn't so directly involved in the permitting, um, so I wasn't aware of any any real problems. I just know that this was something that was an alternative to shoreline har armoring. And to the city's credit, they have been very willing to experiment on things like this, um, including that cobble nourishment and and other uh, things in Ventura. So uh, I think the Coastal Commission was was happy to to well as part of the process they're happy to be part of the process and to provide the permits okay um was there any community opposition to manage retreat if so what were the major concerns and how did you reconcile them um we really didn't have opposition to manage retreat other than the fairgrounds concerns about parking and uh you know that was the real hurdle and it took a long long time as i said multiple boards and revisiting over and over again how we were going to address this because from their point of view they're they're giving up property um now the the trade-off there was that the city deeded their road back to the fairgrounds, so uh, that property was offset by uh, the addition of new property. So um, things worked out quite well. Um, you know, we did a lot of community outreach for a long, long time to, to get people to understand what this is all about, to show up at the public meetings and support the idea of managed retreat. And, um, you know, there's always a couple of surfers out there who just, just dump the rocks, dump the rocks. But um, uh, in general, I think uh, the community was very supportive. Okay, I love this. Mark wrote in to remind us that the CDP was appealed on the basis of parking for the public by a coastal commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did have a challenge. <laughs> But we worked it out. Yeah, parking, I would say, was the, is, has been the main issue um, with on all fronts, um, but no resistance from the community on the actual retreat or the project in general, I would say. Um, uh, someone would like to know, how much do you expect that removing the dam would affect the beach width? Uh, we are currently studying that, and that's a, that's a, a good question. Um, and as I said, it is so dependent upon the hydrology of the watershed. Um, you know, we just had the fire and floods, and, and then when we go through a drought, the, the beach recedes again. But the initial estimates were that we would receive about 30% more sediment um, over a course of 50 years with dam removal. So. Um, the studies that are currently underway doing a much closer look at that and, and hopefully they still show some benefit. <laughs> okay. Um, so 
uh, a related question, if you feel like you didn't fully answer this, what will the area look like if Matilaha is removed? Well, uh, yeah, I think we we, yeah. we should probably expect the beach to be wider uh, at certain periods in, in the future because of that. Um, and actually, I just see Louis, Louis did uh, comment here. He did say that the run-up retreat distance was computed as lasting for 20 to 50 years, assuming half foot of sea level rise. Um, so, um, like I said, extreme sea level rise is going to be the time when uh, the fairgrounds would be inundated and probably need to be relocated. Uh, you mentioned seasonal beach profiles. Do you have images or thoughts comparing summer, sandy, and winter, less sand or exposed cobble beach profiles? Um, well, yes, that is that is true. <laughs> um, the, the cobble seems to uh, maintain its profile pretty nicely. The sand comes and goes seasonally. Um, and I mean, it's, it's amazing to me, the rocks that you could see that spur groin that we were just talking about, uh, are almost completely buried in sand, uh, in the summer. And, uh, when you go and stand out there right now, you can see that it's, it's at least eight feet of sand, uh, that we're getting, uh, in the summer months. So, um, the changes are dramatic, um, but the, the, the whole point of this project was to reinforce the back shore as opposed to try and reinforce the active shoreline. So allowing that active shoreline to come and go as it does naturally, which is primarily the sand, um, has been very effective. Okay, we have a couple more questions and we're at one o'clock. So um, I think, Paul, you said you could stay for a few extra minutes. You wanna do these last couple and then we'll sign off. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, for the beach sand source, we're assuming that there was one single CDP that approved the sand removal for multiple properties, not individual permits for each property owner. Is that correct? And I think she's asking about the Pierpont sand. And I believe that's a programmatic CDP that they they, they do that on a recurring basis. Do you know more about that, Paul? It is recurring, it's annual, and uh, I assume that that is a programmatic, and it's for the whole neighborhood, um, yeah. which, by the way, was a settlement to a lawsuit. Yeah. Um, okay, last question. <laughs> It's a good last question. Is it possible to combine this approach with existing armoring slash gray infrastructure or mutually exclusive? Well, it's very site specific. Um, I could see where in some cases you might want uh, some sort of structure that would uh, maintain uh, beach width in association with uh, a retreat. Um, um, but the intent of this project obviously was to demonstrate that you could do it without uh, any kind of uh, gray infrastructure. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that with sea level rise, we're gonna have to get really creative and look at this as I kind of alluded to earlier in terms of, um, especially in already highly uh, impacted and engineered coastlines, uh, how might we want to change the way that we manage those already engineered coastlines? And in some cases, you would want to retreat, and in other cases, you might want some kind of sand or sediment retention structures that would be able to um, uh, maintain uh, beach width for a longer period of time. And I think uh, Dave Revel had uh, had a suggestion for something like this in his uh, uh, coastal resiliency uh, study for the county of Ventura. And in fact, I think he had in there actually putting in some uh, cobble groins 
So those would kind of be, a, uh, I guess, a temporary uh, groin type structure that would help uh, slow sand transport along the coast. So um, that's a good question. It's not an easy answer. Okay, I think Dan is having trouble with his audio. So I'm gonna go ahead and close for him unless he jumps in. Um, Thank you, Paul. That was an awesome presentation. A really great comprehensive look at Surfers Point. And um, if anyone has any questions, you can follow up with Paul or myself, Kara Kemmler at the Coastal Conservancy. Um, so thank, thanks everyone for calling in and the great questions. Yeah, and I'll just add that, you know, that VenturaRiver.org um, uh, I've been posting photos and uh, a lot of information. So there's more information there and feel free to contact me if you have any more questions. Thanks again for having me. Thanks, Paul.